John Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Democrat David Garcia and Republican Doug Ducey vying to win the office of governor. Ducey seeking a second term. Garcia is hoping he wins the top job. Over the next half hour, you will hear from both men. And you decide on Fox 10 Newsmaker Saturday. Thanks for being with us. We're going to start with Democrat David Garcia. Great to see you. We've got limited time, so I'm kind of kind of going to rush you along, but great to see sure. you. Sure, good to see you as well. Thank let's you. Talk, let's start with education. We've got a $10, $10 billion budget in this state. Roughly half of it is spent on K-12. through That's about $5 billion. Is that not enough to educate these kids? We've got $1.1 million. Is that not enough? Half of the budget? Well, I, I'm glad that you that you started with education because it is the biggest issue in Arizona. You think so, in for many sure. Ways. And it's not just K-12. Okay? Education is also the pathway and the key for economic development for the state as well. So education plays a role in many areas. So when you look at $5 billion, you have to look at it in, in context. Our students, our state, is competing with other students in other states. And compared to other states, we are at the bottom or near the bottom in just about every indicator. It means that our schools don't have the sufficient resources. Our teachers are taking, taking resources out of their own pockets. Or to be an, a teacher in Arizona, we have a lot of teachers who are working two or three jobs to stay in the classroom. It's the reason why teachers, if you ask them themselves, they took this on, into their own hands to make a statement of, of, with, the, of, with the governor and the legislature that this has to stop. Mm -hmm. We've got to start investing in Let's public schools. Let's talk about that. Red for Ed, it was the seminal moment in this entire debate. Um, I mean, the, the march was just we've never seen anything like this do you think though the work stoppage was necessary because the governor's contention is i had offered now granted he he had to he had to be pushed no doubt about that but he had offered this 20 percent raise over three years and still the teachers walked out did was that step necessary was it unfair to parents unfair to students that they walked well let me go back to a bit of, of history here as a parent, I lost trust in Doug Ducey after Prop 123. See, Proposition 123, and I believe any new administration gets the opportunity to get started and a show of goodwill. I believe that. I believe we should do that as a, as a society, regardless of your political party. Doug Ducey said, Proposition 123, trust me, and step four will be positive for public schools. Step four was universal expansion of vouchers or empowerment scholarships in Arizona. As a parent, I felt betrayed. And so you have to go back to a history here with Doug Ducey. When he says, I promise something in the future, I believe the education community and others don't have trust in him and don't believe that he's going to hold those promises. So even though in the end you do get a 20% raise for teachers over three years, do you not think that that's an act of good faith? That he's saying, well, look, clear, I, I may have had to be pushed, sure. but I'm going there. Well, I appreciate you saying that because being pushed is very consistent with Doug Ducey's administration. He has had to be pushed to take a, a tough position on a lot of things, charter school accountability, highway patrols, for example. But on this particular one, it is not 20 over three years. It is 8%, 10% this year. Right. Not all teachers, by the way, with a promise for the remainder the remainder. But that's in the a district decision, years. right? Because districts will get the money. It's kind of how they allocate it, but depending on whether a teacher will get it. But it's the remainder that is a promise. It's, not, it's 20 by 20. Doug Ducey may not be in office, will not be in office for the other 20. Now, you've been saying that that's only part of the equation that the funding for schools, that the teachers have gotten a lot of the attention, but you're saying the funding for schools in general, just forget teacher pay, just to make the education better in buildings and in, in, in the experience is not there. Well, here's where I believe Doug Ducey also missed what teachers were saying. Teachers did not go up there and just simply talk about teacher raises. They talked about improving public education and improving schools. They understand that if you just give a teacher raise, it means that the dollars will have to come out of someplace else. In other words, the other key people who also make schools run will not be included. This is about school improvement, and it includes everyone who makes our schools a better place. I'll give you a quick example. The first person my daughter sees in the morning is Miss Melanie, the bus driver. Miss Melanie has a very important job. Get our daughter to school safely. Mm -hmm. And what teachers are saying is when schools run well, we take care of folks like Miss Melanie as well. Okay, the, on the dollars issue, taxpayers also have a stake in this, obviously. Can, can you make a correlation between dollars spent and outcomes, either better test scores, better students, better graduation rates, something. If we're going to do this, taxpayers should be able to expect a return on investment, right? 
Absolutely. And taxpayers put this on the on on the ballot with invest in ed it was taken off right um, but they we're going to get to that and but they have made that expressly look what dollars what dollars uh, um, what dollars equate to is opportunity and particularly in a state like Arizona where we have a, a relatively poor population particularly if you're a child what we what we are looking for is opportunity and it's, it is providing that opportunity for a student that can then take it upon themselves that's most important do you believe in school choice as a principal in other words we've got now 16 percent of our kids i believe that's a number going to charter schools that's a big number they these are people who have made a choice that they want a different experience than their, than their public school is, is offering. I do, but I disagree with your number. We have 95% of people who have made a choice. See, here's how I see choice. My daughter is in a traditional public school. Mm -hmm. That is my choice. That's our, that's our family's choice. And that choice. is my choice. Uh, my kids are in but public when, school as well. When you say 16%, the assumption is that only those who have gone, gotten up and left have made a choice. I don't see it that way at all. That's a, it's a good point you make. That's a good point. You're saying that the choice did, because we made that choice. We you didn't choose a charter. You could probably we chose public school. Exactly right. You could probably send your children to other schools. You are making a choice just like I did. And so my stance has always been that if we are going to honor school choice, we need to honor all choices, including the choice to stay in a traditional public school. Do you worry that, bottom line here, I think, I think what, what no one is willing to say is that the push for charters and choice is an assault on traditional public school districts and that if those continue to flourish it will erode dollars take dollars away and destroy the traditional public school model the biggest threat to destroying traditional pu public education are actually the expansion of empowerment scholarships and school vouchers. That's the biggest threat. Why? Because those dollars go directly out of the public school system into, into private Let's explain schools. that for a minute. And this is, uh, this is Prop, what, 305? Correct. This allows people, uh, you folks at home, if you've got kids, to take your tax dollars on a yes vote and use those tax dollars to take your kid and put it anywhere you want. So you're literally taking it out of the public school, traditional public school, and say, spending it on a charter, right? You said yes vote. I'd encourage a no vote on right. that, but functionally that would happen. Like what? And you're a no vote, why? I'm a no vote because if we allow that to happen, we will have a society of haves and have nots immediately. That the notion here of a kid like myself, first generation college student, the son of a commercial painter, having an opportunity to make it to a place like the University of Chicago eventually and run for governor is based on a fundamental principle of having an equal, a quality education for all students. Opportunity. Opportunity. It goes to opportunity. And so with respect to the kind of system that, would, that a voucher system would have, is you would have haves and have nots. You would have, you would have wealthy schools and not wealthy schools, and less resource schools. And as a result, um, we wouldn't be able to be working on an equity in this state. Let's talk about, for a minute, border security. We'll move away from education for a minute. The other issue uh, seems to be high on voters' list is border security. Is this a function the state should be involved in, period? The state's function, and the county sheriffs have made it clear, they have asked the state to do their job. I joined the Army when I was 17. I was an infantryman. Thank My you job, for your service, by the way. Thank you. My job was to protect, and it was pretty straightforward. Everybody did their job so that you could count on your fellow, your, your, your fellow man. What the Arizona needs to do is patrol our highways 24-7. The county sheriffs are asking for that. Doug Ducey said it was going to be a priority when he started. We are still leaving uh, the Department of Public Safety is still not funded well enough to have 24-7 patrols, and as a result, it is leaving our highways wide open. But that's when people get across the border to, to enter uh, Arizona. They're already in at that point. Well, let's be clear. Doug Ducey's Border Strike Force is in Maricopa County. It is right. not just on the border. Right, right. The Yuma County Sheriff made a very good point. He said that on any given day, there's a thousand different agents in his county working on the border. And rather than duplicating their efforts, he is asking the state and the Department of Public Safety to be funded to do their unique job, which is guard the highways. Ducey, and that will, be my, that will be my focus. Governor Ducey has said, basically in, in the ads that we've all been watching, that you want to abolish ICE, you want no border wall. Is any of this true? None of that is true. I am against Trump's wall, and I will stand against Trump's wall. I think it's an ineffective what, use of resources. What does Trump's wall exactly mean? Because the, the, the goalposts keep moving. I mean, we were told it was going to be a big, beautiful wall. Now it's a, it's a 
amalgam I'm, of I'm, different things. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but putting a physical barrier between us and our largest trading partner in the manner that Trump wants to do, more symbolic than anything, is A, going to hurt Arizona from a, from a business standpoint, and I think sends the wrong message. In addition, what I think Arizonans need to understand is, like I said before, I took an oath to defend this country when I joined the military. I take that oath seriously today, and I will take that oath with me to the governor's office. But with respect to the reason I think people are talking about this, it's because of the million dollars in ads that are out there, including watching, watching them in the green room here today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I think what I think what's important there is you know at the end of at the end of, of the debates Doug Ducey pointed the public to effectively a hit site, and as an Arizonan I found that a bit disgraceful that after four years you don't have enough record to run on that you got to point the public to a, to a hit site against your opponent. Let's quickly talk about water uh, because we're running short of time. Lake Mead is at a tipping point. We get our water CAP through Lake Mead. If we got to a point and you were governor where, where Lake Mead dropped below the point where it could feed CAP and, and quench a thirsty desert here in, in the Phoenix area and all, all across Arizona, what would you do? I think this is a circumstance where you need a leader on this issue and not a follower. This has been an issue and it's been an issue for Doug Ducey's entire administration. Part of the challenge here is to solve this issue, you have to bring everybody to the table in an open and transparent conversation because it is, it is going to impact everyone, it's going to involve everyone. And Doug Ducey is yet to bring everyone together. From my count, it is over 40 different stakeholders in two different states that need to be in on this conversation and we will start it, we will start it uh, immediately. A couple seconds governor. left. Why does Doug Ducey not deserve to be reelected and David Garcia should be elected? First and foremost is education. The single issue in our state that can advance us the furthest, give opportunity to our families and to our students is education. But in addition, if we want to prosper as a state and compete with the rest of our Western neighbors and bring in the kind of high quality jobs that are going to improve Arizonans' life, the thing we need to invest in more than anything is education. David Let Garcia. No, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank Democrat you. David Garcia. Um, I got through maybe a third of what I wanted to talk to you about, but I appreciate it. And good luck Thank in you. November. And coming up next, Arizona Governor Doug Ducey. Thank you. Dave. Back on Newsmaker Saturday, joined now by Arizona Governor Doug Ducey. Great to see you. We just Great spoke to, to your opponent. Um, we started with education. And I asked him, you know, with a $10 billion budget in this state and $5 billion of it roughly spent on K through 12, is that not enough to educate 1.1 million kids? Well, I, I do think we need more in terms of K-12 education. I want to see more resources uh, to get inside our classrooms. But, you know, I've been here now almost four years. And I think if you look at Prop 123, the extension of Prop 301, the fact that we've been able to bring teachers' academies to life and in this last session get a 20% pay increase for our teachers by school year 2020, we're off to a really good start. We've got those lawsuits behind us. I do believe there's more to do, but I think we've got to work within our growing economy. I want to have a great education system and a growing economy in a state that people are attracted to come to. You and your opponent disagree over school choice. You're a big fan of it. Um, tell me your philosophy on school choice. He, he definitely thinks that it, it could erode public schools, traditional public schools, district schools. Well, I, I care about all of our kids, 1.1 million children in our school system in Arizona. So whether it's public districts or public charters, I think choice has been good for Arizona. We've seen what's happened with our public charters. It's improved our entire system. Arizona students are leading the nation in improvement in math and reading today. And then when we talk about educational savings accounts, I used the example of, you know, a young man named Jordan who's got cerebral palsy and autism. Without his ESA, his mom wouldn't be able to access the educational therapy. The great story of the, you know, the young man who scored two touchdowns, he's blind playing freshman football, he, his ESA pays for his braille books. Education, yeah. empowerment, scholarship. But yeah, my opponent would take these options o away. So I want to see choices for our parents and an improving school system. So you're a yes on Prop 305. I'm a yes on Prop 305. Even though some of the supporters of 305, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the opponents of, of 305 are actually people who, they like choice, but they don't think it goes far enough because it's capped at half a percent. 
Well, the could, in the in the entire state yes. who could take advantage of it. Well, the law that I signed would allow 5,000 kids for the next six years. I, I like to believe that you can prove a policy out. You can demonstrate that it works. That's what we've been able to do with the original educational savings accounts. That's what Jordan Visser is is benefiting from, and the other young man that I talked about. Mm -hmm. And there's other kids that don't fall into these special populations. So I want parents to have options, and I want our parents to be able to say, send their kid uh, where they think they should go to school. What's the best option? Let's talk about the Red for Ed. It was a seminal moment in this education. Some would call it a crisis in Arizona. This scene, it was right outside of your office. You could see it from the ninth floor. Um, did we need to get to that point? Take me back through the timeline for a second. Did you not offer to give them a 20% raise? Yes, you were pressured to do it, and you went there. You said, look, I'm going to do this for you guys. Did you ever contact the leadership and say, listen, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try to get it done, but don't walk out. And if you walk out, all bets are off. Well, we were talking with teachers the entire time, and we were talking with superintendents as well. Now, John, that's not the way I talk to teachers. I'm on the side of the teachers. I, I want to work You've with said them. that over and over, but some people thought you actually should have been a little bit more, for lack of a better word, Trumpian, and said, yeah. hey, listen, guys, I'm trying to make this happen for you, but if you pull this, all bets are off. Well, I knew I could make it happen for them, and I think it's important to remember, you know, not that long ago, three years ago, we had a $1 billion budget deficit in this state. So I think the teachers earned and deserved this, but it's because of the booming economy that we have, and we did present the pay increase before the walkout happened, but it was really the, the activists and the organizers, the lawyers and the unions, not the teachers, but those folks said you have to walk out to get the pay raise because the governor's not going to be able to deliver. I'm proud that we were able to deliver, but I had to work with legislative leadership and people on both sides of that aisle. I mean, Steve Farley voted yes on the 20% pay increase, and my opponent... Former the candidate for governor yeah, who, got, who lost to my opponent to told people to vote no on it. Right. Okay, so during all of this, you have made comments in the past that you said really this was all about the ballot initiative, which just, just got washed off by the uh, state Supreme Court. Um, the Invest in Ed initiative. You thought it was about that in, in the bottom line. They really did want to walk out and they wanted to push this initiative. Do well, you? I wanted to get the raise to the teachers, but the union and the activists, not the you teachers. You see these as two separate entities, oh, don't you? For, for, well, for certain. I mean, we, 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 need, we need the teachers and they're doing great work. But we've, we've also, you can't take the politics out of politics and, and the union and, and the activists. They wanted to double state income tax, create two new brackets, right. uh, but it was writ written in a misleading way. And now my opponent has no education plan. I mean, that was his plan, was to double taxes and to bring those dollars in. What I've said is we've got $420 million in our general fund right now. The CBO shows a $1.5 billion growth in our revenues over the next five years. Let's use those existing dollars, bring them into K-12, get them in the classroom. But we've got roads and, and bridges and infrastructure I was going to ask you, what do you, do with the, what do you do with the surplus? What do you do with it? Well, it's a, it's a nice issue to have, right? We haven't had that in some time here in Arizona. So I want to make sure that we're making good decisions, that we're, we've got a growing education system, we're rewarding our teachers, but with a growing state, you've got to take care of roads and bridges and infrastructure, and we have public safety needs as, as well. Our Department of Public Safety, we want to make sure that we're protecting what's happening in southern Arizona with drug cartels and human right. trafficking. We'll get to the border in a yeah. minute. Uh, um, David Garcia, your opponent in the, in the earlier segment, he said, listen, um, if we don't get this education thing figured out, nothing happens. The state won't grow. You can't attract business. It's a drag on the whole system. He was talking a little bit about charters in that mix, saying that if you really try to push charters and let other private kind of schooling creep in, it will undermine traditional public schools, and he says you'll have a system of haves and have-nots. Well, first, I want to see our education system continue to improve and its resources and its reforms. But I really get sick of these people that keep dumping on Arizona and want to play this blame Arizona first game. We're the fastest growing county in the country right now in Maricopa County. We've had 300 companies that have moved here. We've had 230,000 private sector jobs. These businesses are coming here because they know that their owners and their employees can access an excellent 
want education. It's just that in too many parts of our states, they can't do that. That's where the achievement gap is. That's our high free and reduced lunch areas. That's our tribal nations. That's why we've tried to take dollars and target them where we can close that achievement gap to benefit all of our children. Would you say that based on what we spend in Arizona, because we keep looking at it as a dollars issue, if you spend this much, you'll be here in your ranking. Doesn't the taxpayer deserve a return on investment? Absolutely. And have you not argued that given what we're spending, we're actually getting a pretty good result with, with recent test results? And I give credit to our teachers because we are getting a return on this investment. And now Nobody we, talks about this because the taxpayers are owed a return on this. Oh, they are, they are owed a return. The kids are owed a return. And our teachers are delivering on that return. That's why I want to reward them. But now we're going to see that a dollar invested in the K-12 education can be measured by fourth and eighth grade math reading and science, high school completion, career and technical education, going to our universities, and then an economy where a kid actually has skills when they graduate that they can take to, to the marketplace. Quick thing on border. Um, you've talked about border security. Is that something the state police DPS should be involved in? Oh, absolutely. The border strike force is not made just a, a Fed issue. Oh, it's not just a Fed issue. I mean, especially as a border state. And with the, the drug cartels and the human trafficking and the child sex trafficking, to have our state troopers working with our border sheriffs and local law enforcement and partnering with our federal government, that's why we've been able to interdict so many of these dangerous, poisonous drugs that would be in our high schools or on campuses or in our neighborhood. And there's a lot more left to do there, John. Uh, this, this issue has come up. That, that the sheriffs of Yuma and Santa Cruz County say DPS isn't patrolling the border midnight to 6 a.m. There's law enforcement in the state of Arizona 24-7. Whether it's DPS or not. Yeah, and we've wanted to take the border strike force and focus on the drug cartels, on the bad guys. So we want to bring back more dollars into the Department of Public Safety, and we'll have more people, I guess, writing more traffic tickets. But the, the cartels, the drug trafficking, the child sex trafficking, those are the things that are really harming our citizens and our country, and that's what the border strike force is focused on. I asked David Garcia. Um, we've got Lake Mead at a tipping point point we I mean if it gets much lower CAP could may not have its full quotient of, of, of water what would you do in, in a case where Lake Mead could not deliver what we need? Well, we're actually acting on water right now. Arizona is in a pretty solid position around water. It's part of the reason that I asked Senator John Kyle right. to go back to Washington to fill the these ir pictures. irreplaceable I mean, it is alarming. senator uh, in, in John McCain. But we're also working with our federal government on a drought contingency plan so that the state of Arizona speaks with one voice on water. We're very good at this. We're better than anybody else at the United States. We need to reform in this next legislative session, and then we're going to start talking about a generational project. There has to be a rationale for a politician to run. There has to be a reason, not just to win the office, but to, for you, a second term. What is it, what is the rationale for people watching right now to reelect Doug Ducey? I want to secure Arizona's future. I came into office with a $1 billion budget deficit. I said that I wanted to kickstart our economy, that I wanted to restore our K-12 education system. The Arizona Repub public endorsed me as Arizona's governor for tough times. Well, we've navigated through tough During times. During the primary, right? Yeah, and now we want to we wanna build on this momentum. I have an opponent that wants to make us a carbon copy of California, wants to double your income taxes. What I want to do is make sure that we're secure financially, that our schools and neighborhoods are safer, and that our borders are safer, and that Arizona continue to grow to be the state that so many people around the country want to call home. Final question, what's job one right now for you? Well, for me, it's always going to be a combination of education, economy, and public safety. As a chief executive, you have to have a balance of, in these priorities. Good to see you, Governor. Thanks, Jim. Great, great to Appreciate see you. It. Best of luck in, in November, and uh, love to have you back. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks for joining us on, New on Newsmaker Saturday. Some final thoughts right after this. Thanks to both David Garcia and Governor Doug Ducey for uh, spending some time with us, giving you an opportunity to size up the two candidates, in essence, side by side. Love to have the conversation extended to my uh, social media platforms, John Hook, Fox 10 Phoenix on Twitter, and on Facebook. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday.